just for time's sake on our last day. So the easiest approach, I think, to starting out this methodology, uh, you have to get your genetics from somewhere. Arguably, the easiest way to do that is to buy a syringe of a liquid mycelium from somebody else. A uh, number of websites uh, supply them. There's um, Mycology Classifieds on Facebook. There's uh, Shermery Microtopia. This forum people trade and will sell stuff there. Uh, one website is Spore Works. I believe they sell syringes of commercial or you know edible species. I can't speak to that quality, but they sell them. Um, eBay, you know, is always questionable, but you can buy syringes there. Amazon too. About twenty bucks, pretty common uh, price. Pass this around, you'll see my son floating around in some sugar water. Cool. So you're gonna want to order a syringe. We're working with the oyster species, so the pearl oyster specifically. There's a number of oysters. Pleurotus ostriatus is the Latin name. And there's a bunch of different strains, especially with the oyster, because it's so popular, so easy to grow. There's a lot of different strains that will fruit at different temperatures. There's warm temp for the summer <coughs> grows, and there's cold temp for the winter grows. So you want to get a strain that fruits at the right temp for you. What we're actually going to be inoculating with is a strain from Field and Forest. They're a good company from the Midwest. This is their Pohu strain, and it grows at a pretty wide range of temps. I forget exactly, I'm going to say probably fruits from like... 50 up to 75, pretty wide range. So get a good strain, um, and or even species, there's other oyster species that are like subtropical, so they fruit even higher temps, so you can look into all of that. Put your order in, while you're waiting for that to arrive, you need to make your lids. Uh, wide mouth lids are the best, because the wide mouth jars are easy to clean, clean jars pain in the neck, so be prepared. Um, and then you need to drill out some holes and, and prep them. Uh, again, it's all on the wiki, but pass this around. One hole is 3 16 inch, that's for your air filter. And the other bigger one for the silicone is 5 16 inch. I don't know if that is millimeters, sorry. Uh, what's, uh, the, what's the first one? 3 16 inch. It's all on the wiki again. Oh, okay. um, so then, so you drill the holes, and we'll, we'll do some of this in just a bit. And then the first question is, what do I uh, put over the air filter? You can use uh, micropore tape, like from your first aid kit, and put a couple layers on both sides. That works. Um, I don't like it because it gets wet easily and just really thin and delicate. If your filter gets wet, it becomes a highway that microbes can travel through and get into your jar. So I don't like it. Um, there's some other options, but to cut to the chase, what I really prefer is polyfill or what is, that's the brand name for synthetic fiber fill, uh, synthetic cotton polyester fibers. And we'll practice this later, but it works well because you can uh, make a big filter if you're working with a big bag or container or a little small one. So I take a little ball of this, <coughs> wad it up, and twist it into a point, and poke it through the small hole. <coughs> and pull it till it's really dang snug, like real snug, like it won't go any further, and that's how you want it. Um, don't need a ton, practice makes perfect. And I cut off the extra just for like aesthetics. So that works well. Um, you know, you usually have to replace it every time the filter just gets dirty. I'll pass this around, one around, you can see it got kind of dirty. Uh, so you replace it. So what I'll do is I just have like hundreds of these, and as I, they, they need repair or what have you, I set them aside, and then I'll spend like a couple hours every couple months and just fix up all my lids at once. Um, so you do that, and then you need to apply the silicone, and unfortunately we don't have like an overhead projector, but we'll practice later. Uh, the trick with the silicone, so we want high temperature RTV, room temperature vulcanizing, uh, gasket maker or just silicone from the auto store, hardware store, it's usually used for engines, high temp applications. And we basically want a, a blob over this bigger hole and a really solid taper, good adhesion. Yeah, you could use sandpaper if you want even better adhesion. I don't usually do that. Um, what you want is, of course, for it to be clean and to have roughly about a, a, a quarter, like the size of a coin, the quarter uh, diameter disc of tapering. So really good, a lot of contact because you don't want that seal to break while you're working with the lid and then stuff gets in. So We'll practice later, but basically what I'm doing is kind of pushing just really gently a bit out over the hole and then smearing it to make a nice wide uh, disc. Some look prettier than others. And then basically do the same on the other side. Uh, in one of my classes, one of the students said what we're making is basically a pea, like the vegetable, with a blanket over it. 
Okay, so that's what we're making. And then dolly that up, yeah. roughly something like that. Could be better, could be worse. Careful, it's wet. Make a bunch of those and let them cure overnight, and then you got your lids. So then you need to, you're waiting for this to come in the mail, and while you're doing that, you need to make up your sugar water, because what you're going to do is take this and expand it and use this as your seed to inoculate more jars of the sugar water. Right? And we're going to turn it and basically have an abundance of liquid mycelium to spray on our cat or whatever we want to spray <laughs> on. Uh, we got so much of it. Right? And so the ingredients you use, there's a number of recipes. Um, uh, there's a couple I think written in the wiki. The one that I often use is for every pint of non-chlorinated water, good, clean, healthy, filtered, what have you, water. We don't want distilled, we, have water, we want minerals. But non-chlorinated water, one pint, so about half a quart jar. I'll add a tablespoon of light malt extract from the brew shop and a tablespoon of dextrose, also known as corn sugar. Uh, a little bit of gypsum, maybe a little pinch of like rock dust for some minerals if you want to get into that. Maybe a couple drops of vegetable oil because the fungi just like us need a balanced diet. They want all those nutritional components. But you don't have to. You can just do the two sugars and that's good as well. Other people use honey. Some people use just corn syrup. I never do. Uh, I like to give them some more nutrient dense, if you will. Dissolve that on the stove top, just low heat. You don't want to boil it. You don't want to caramelize the sugars because that can uh, be toxic to the fungus. And we put it into our jar and we put our uh, lid on it. And then you're going to put that into your pressure cooker uh, with some foil over it. The foil is meant to protect the, the, the polyfill from getting wet from the steam in a pressure cooker. Uh, if the filter again gets wet, it becomes like a highway, right? So if you don't know how to use a pressure cooker, it's like a half an hour discussion into its own right about how to properly use a pressure cooker. So you, need to, you need to learn how to use a pressure cooker safely. It's like probably our biggest safety hazard in the mushroom game is a pressure cooker blowing up on you if it's cracked or anything. So you got to learn to use it safely. Uh, you always got to have some water in it so it doesn't run dry. You want to make sure the seal is good, it's not cracked or warped, all these things. So you got to learn to use a pressure cooker. So assuming that you learn to do that, you know how to do that, you put it into a pressure cooker, seal it down, Slowly bring the pressure up to 15 PSI.